Well, let me ask you to turn on turn your Bibles. Turn on your Bibles, if you would. Flip the switch. Now, we're going to look at Romans again. Romans chapter 3. And hopefully, I began to make you uh, feel a little less, maybe less excited about who you are this morning as we talked about the depravity of man and uh, also talking about the depravity of, of women as well, children. You know, it sin affects all of us. And tonight, we're going to finish what we started this morning. And just to catch up, uh, for some of you who may not have been here this morning, this morning we looked at our depravity or our corruption that comes from our original sin nature. And we looked at two this morning, and we saw this morning that we have a corrupt wisdom. Uh, Paul says in, in verse uh, 11, it says, there, are, there is none who understands. And then we went on to see that we also have corrupt wills. There's none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. All Together they have become uh, useless. There's none who does good, not even one. So we saw both of those two things. Now, what we're trying to put together in these verses from 9 to 20 is what you might expect if you walked into God's courtroom and Paul was the prosecuting attorney. And the indictment is verse 10, that there is none righteous. No, not one. And in order to prove that point, you've got the evidence, which is verses 11 through 18. And then you come to verse 19 and 20, which is the final verdict and summing it all up, that final argument. So we're going to continue tonight and look at three other ways that we are corrupt. But I heard about a dad who decided he was going to, to, uh, to bake, and a lot of dads don't bake. I'm certainly not one who bakes. I don't bake. I burn if I ever, ever try to bake. But this dad was going to bake something. He had a reason for it. His kids, he couldn't get the message across that even little wrong decisions, that the little things that we allow in our life uh, affect us and, and should be avoided. And, you know, when you think about what you might watch on TV or see in a movie or reading a book or discuss or stories you might tell, you know, even the little things are, are to be avoided. We should always seek for purity. Well, he made some cookies. He decided he was going to bring a batch of cookies together. And as he got them baking, the uh, aroma of the cookies filled the house. And that drew the kids, that drew their friends, and all of them showed up in the kitchen to, uh, to enjoy some of these cookies. And as he was bringing them out of the oven, and while they were waiting to cool, the kids were just waiting to get at them. He said, well, wait a minute, I want to tell you the ingredients in these, these cookies. And he began to go down a list of things that you would normally put together in cookies. And then he said, well, there's one other ingredient that I put in there. I took the time to go back into our backyard where uh, our dog is and to scoop up some things that are left on the ground out there, and I mixed that in the batter too. Not a whole bunch at all, but I just went ahead and put just a little bit in there. Now, the cookies are cool enough now. Would you like one? Kids didn't want the cookies anymore. And it didn't take much to offend them enough that they didn't want anything to do with what Dad had cooked up. And, you know, we don't think there's a lot of we don't see a lot in our sin nature, but when God looks at it, it's very offensive to God. And we need to realize that is we may be feeling about ourselves and thinking, well, I'm a lot better than so-and-so, or you know, I could be a lot worse than I am. But God, through his holy eyes, says that's something that could never come into heaven. The sin nature has to be dealt with. And there's only one provision, and that is through Jesus Christ. And again, the sin nature, the evidence that we are depraved comes through, through five different ways that Paul brings out. The first one was the corrupt wisdom that we have, that none, none understand, that, that it takes more than light to see, it takes sight that God has to give us through this Holy Spirit's work in our life, and that we have corrupted wills, that on our own we will seek after our own things, we'll always be pulling away from God, but God pursued us and brought us back to himself. And then tonight we're going to think about, and starting in verse 13, that we have corrupted words. Our communication is corrupted. It says their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of ass is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. You know, coming out of your communication uh, demonstrates what is in your heart. The things that ultimately you, uh, you will say, the things that... Uh, the, the way that you describe life and describe yourself to things, the way you respond to things and, and uh, your verbal response, it describes very much of what is really at, at the root of it all, which is in your, in your heart. He uses words like throat, tongues, lips, mouth, 
Then he uses other words to describe them like open grave, deception, poison, cursing, and bitterness. You know, Jesus said it this way in Matthew uh, 12, 34, as he talked about the Pharisees. He said, you brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. And then a few chapters later in, in Matthew 15, he said, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the, heart, from the heart and defile the man. Now, in our day, we might say what's down in the well is going to come up in the bucket. And suppose you went to an ENT, an ear, nose, and throat person, and you had physical problems that you were trying to discover what they were. And normally, if you'd go to some, some doctor, especially a doctor who would deal with that with your throat and things, he would probably first tell you, well, open your mouth, let's look at your throat. Then he'd say, well, stick out your tongue, and let's look at your tongue. And he would start to determine your physical health, much like we see the spiritual health being described here. When Paul is saying their throat is an open grave, their tongues keep deceiving, the poison of ass is under their lips, their mouth is full of cursing. And what if you looked down your throat and said, boy, that looks like an open grave? And we wouldn't like that at all. But that's what Paul is saying. As he looks inside of us, with God's eyes, he sees an open grave. And literally, it means a yawning grave, like a grave just, somebody had been covered up in a grave, but it just kind of yawned and opened up and showed the contents. And in Paul's day, when he wrote, they would not wait three or four days for a funeral. If somebody died, they would have an immediate funeral. And when Jesus died on the cross, they had to get him down off the cross and get him buried in the sepulcher before sunset because they didn't want to wait to the other end of the Sabbath. That would be too long to wait for a body that had not been embalmed or had not been, been treated properly. And so for them to think of an exposed grave and the contents of a grave, that was very offensive. In fact, Jesus described the Pharisees as white as sepulchers where the outside looked, looked uh, all made up, but the inside was dead men's bones, something that was very offensive. So he describes their throat as an open grave. Then he goes on to say, with their tongues, they keep deceiving. That tells me when sinful man speaks, there's always an agenda at work. There's always an angle that he's working, and the truth is very hard to get at. Whenever we tell a story, whenever somebody tells us to talk about ourselves or talk about somebody else, that often that sin kicks in and we elaborate or somehow we don't give the accurate truth. That is just something that's very consistent with the sin nature being within us. And he says that with their tongues, they keep on deceiving. And the word for deceiving is the same word they use for fish bait. And if you know anything about fish bait, it's something that, that camouflages a hook that is waiting behind it in order to, to capture you. So it covers up something that's dangerous and deadly. So whenever we speak to someone, we have to realize that the sin nature is always something that has to be taken into account. And whenever we talk about anything, we always have to stop ourselves and say, wait a minute, how is my sin nature affecting what I am saying? The third thing he said is the poison of ass is under their lips. The poison of a snake is under their lips. And James tells us that that uh, all types of animals can be tamed. But he said the tongue is something that cannot be tamed. Man has never been able to, to tame it. And every one of us have an opinion. I know that, uh, that is, we got as many opinions here as we've got people here. But part of being the body of Christ is learning how to, to use our opinions. You know, Lynn and I have been looking at floor covering, wall covering, you know, trying to decide how to paint the wall or paper the wall. She's looking at all these different ways of doing it. And I have an opinion. But, you know, she'll ask me that opinion, and I have to be very guarded and saying, you know what, if this is what you like, this is what I like, and try to encourage her, because ultimately, my goal is unity and love in my household. And I want to make sure what's on the wall, what's on the floor, is something that she can live with, because I can live with with, I could live with anything on the wall or anything on the floor, but I know that it means a lot to her, and I want to encourage her. So I, I recognize that, that an opinion is something that has to be used in the proper way. And I know that every one of us has an opinion here at, at Living Oaks. And how are you using that opinion? Because an opinion, as Paul says here, with a sin nature in, in tow can be like poison that is hidden.
you think of the poison of ass being under the lips, that reminds me of the fangs. And if you look at a snake with its mouth closed and you didn't know anything about snakes, you'd be very surprised to see a, a, an additional picture of a snake with his mouth open, with those fangs exposed. You think, where in the world did those large fangs come from? Where were they hidden? So Paul is saying that under the lips there is that poison waiting to strike. You know, we don't ask people to check their brains at the door when they come to church. But we do realize as we study Scripture that all through the New Testament it talks about surrendering rights, preferring others before ourselves, becoming servants instead of lording over others. And in Philippians 2, Paul, Paul says this. He says, make my joy complete. And you might wonder what's going to come after that. What would make Paul happy about the church in Philippi? Well, maybe they send him back uh, uh, a notice that they had just built this brand new building. Or maybe they'd send back that the budget was more than double what the needs were. Or you know, other, other ways that they might make his joy complete. This is what made his joy complete. He says, by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, that one purpose we have is pertaining, proclaiming Christ. And then in verse 3, he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. That is what made Paul happy when he saw that in the life of the church, no matter where they met, no matter how much money was spent or how much attendance was there, that is what made the Apostle Paul's joy complete. If you think about the power of the tongue, you can have a game, and some people do this from time to time. You have a group of about 10 to 20 people, and you line them up, maybe have them sit in, in chairs, and then you, you tell the first person uh, maybe a, some sort of sentence, and then they whisper it from person to person to person to person, and it works their way all the way to the other end of the line, and then you see what the end result is, how close what the last person says is to what the first person was initially given. And almost always you have so much distortion under the best conditions as it flows through so many different uh, tongues and ears and finally comes to that last person. And it's been drastically changed, just under the, under the best condition. And you can imagine what it does under the worst. Charles Swindoll said this when he talked about the, the tongue. He said three things. He said, number one, think before you speak, talk less, and start today. Those are three good ideas that Charles Swindoll came up with. You think about a snake, again, being, being tamed. I have never gone to a circus and seen a snake act. I know they have snake charmers, but really it's, it's not a trained snake that you're seeing. But it, a snake is impossible to, to tame. And the, the nature of that snake is ultimately going to come out. I read about a man who found a baby rattlesnake. Now, a baby rattlesnake can do a lot of damage, but they're not that intimidating. But he took this snake home and decided he was going to make this snake a pet. Well, that pet got loose in his house. He couldn't find it. Months went by. And he was reaching behind his, his couch for something he had dropped, and that snake latched on to his arm. The nature of that snake ultimately came out and struck back. And that sin nature, if we're not guarded against it, it will ultimately strike us. We may think we've got it totally under, under guard, but it will ultimately strike if we are not cautious. It goes on to say whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. And could you imagine standing before a judge someday whose very name you have used repeatedly to blaspheme and to curse. And I can't imagine people someday who are going to stand before God when they have taken the name of Jesus Christ and taken the name of God and used it to, as very curse words in their life here. But you think about a mouth being full of cursing. The Bible says our mouth should be full of blessing. And, and that is, cursing is the very opposite of, of blessing. And when you bless somebody, when we bless God, we give God, literally it means that we give God his ultimate place. We recognize him for who he is. And cursing is destroying somebody. It is, it is not recognizing for who they are at all, but trying to destroy them and take them to, to some place which they, they aren't at all, to destroy who they are. And, you know, I can imagine standing before God and having 
taken him to a place that he never that he was never to be treated like instead of honoring him and honoring the name of Jesus Christ. But all these things come from the sin nature corrupting man's communication. And that's an evidence of our depravity. And we see it all around us in our society today. It is hard to find a movie or even watch a television show after a certain time of the night that does not have some evidence of this in it. Well, the fourth thing is we have corrupt ways. It says their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their path. And the path of peace they have not known. We have corrupt wisdom, corrupt wills, corrupt words, corrupt ways. Swift feet. Swift feet. Feet that are swift to run to sin. And when you compare love and lust in, in the Bible, you can see that love is long-suffering. Love is patient. But lust is the opposite. It has to, to run, to conquer, or to run, to get to grab on to what it desires. And their feet are swift to shed blood. And that means that sin has just got a hold of the heart. And it's looking for any and every opportunity to exercise that sin. The end result, it says, is a life of destruction and misery. Now, I read this week about some royalty over in Europe two brothers that were vying for the throne. The older brother had the throne. The younger brother uh, led a revolt against the older brother. Now, the older brother, one characteristic about him was he was a very large person. He had a great appetite, and he indulged that uh, appetite as often as he could. And it led to him being given a, a, a nickname, which was Crassus, which, which means in Latin, fat. Well, it, he got captured by his older brother, whose revolt was successful. His older brother took him and built a room around him. And he was put in this room, and his older brother said, you can leave any time that you can fit out the door. He built windows in this room, and he built doors that were just a little bit smaller than regular scale. But his older, his older brother couldn't fit through them. And he says, I'm not keeping you here. You are free to go any time that you can fit out the door. Now, his younger brother was smart enough to send him every day delicious food. And every day, this man had to make a choice between not wanting that food and, and, and trying to slim down to get out that door. And you know, he never got out the door. In fact, it wasn't until his brother finally died in battle that he was come and they had to break down the room around him because he never could get out of the door. He was in there for 10 years. And his appetite had him so conquered that he never could escape. Feet are swift to shed blood and destruction and misery are in their path. You think of feet being on the right path. On the wrong path, it leads to destruction and misery. And you think about, about man. When everything man does, when he builds something, he builds a great city, you end up with slums in part of that city. Everything that man touches or builds, ultimately there will be the evidence of sin rise up somewhere within it, or ultimately it will bring the destruction and decay somewhere along the line. You think about, about smoking, and I thought about smoking this week, as, I, as I've noticed so many young people smoke, and we live in a generation that knows more about the harmful danger of smoking than any generation that has ever lived. You know, smoking, it, the average uh, lessening of your life is 15 years. For every cigarette you pick up, I think it's seven minutes less of life that you can expect to live, much less with all the, uh, the negative health things that come along with it. And yet, we've probably got a generation today that smokes more than any other generation, the one that's coming up, because you see them everywhere, standing outside, and maybe it's just because they can't smoke inside anymore, you see so many smoking outside. But, you know, we know about a generation, as a generation, we know that that is, is harmful. We also know in a generation that uh, they're not exercising is is harmful to us. And yet, if you read at USA Today this past, uh, past week, it says that we live in a nation that uh, never in the history of our nation have we had such a large percentage of obesity. And that our young people today, our children, uh, more than any other generation of children, are struggling with being over, overweight or lack of exercise. You know, we know it, but just like this man who couldn't get out of the room, it still seems to conquer us. And that is a part of the depravity that we have. The path of peace they have not known. We can't get on the right path. 
How many organizations have there been in the history of the world, just in our lifetime, that are trying to bring peace to this world? You know, how many uh, treaties have been written in our lifetime? How many lives have been given? How much money has been spent? You've got the UN, and they have the purpose of maintaining harmony around the world, but they get one area fixed, or try to fix it, and then they get another area. They get one leader halfway uh, settled down, and then they get another leader. You know, man does not have any idea what the path of peace is all about. And here's Jesus saying, I am the Prince of Peace. I have the answer to peace. And yet in our sin nature, but we don't want to hear that. We don't want to surrender ourselves as, a, as, as a overall mankind to allow God to have the right place in our lives. Someone has said that, someone has said that peace is really only an opportunity to reload. And just because you may have supposed peace, it's really just everybody re-equipping themselves for another, another time when war will break out somewhere and somehow. Well, let me give you the last thing, and that is that we have a corrupted worship. Now, we've kind of been building to this because this is the underlying uh, of everything else that we've talked about. We have a corrupted worship. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And to describe worship would be to have a fear of God, to have an awe of God, to have a respect of God, to recognize that we all are accountable to God. The part of our depravity is to have no fear of God. And that, again, is the ultimate problem. There is a slogan out there today that says, No fear. No fear. And I'm afraid that could be a, a bumper sticker on a lot of people's lives. Because they go through life thinking that, well, medical uh, advancements will, will keep death from ever being a problem to me until I'm real old, 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 or accidents won't happen in my life. And then we read every day where this accident happens or this person uh, gets cancer, and all of a sudden they have to face death. But we go through fooling ourselves that we aren't going to have to be accountable or deal with those issues. And you look at our world today, and we have a world that is just strutting its way to hell. Pride in their heart, no sense or fear of God, just strutting their way to hell, parading their sinfulness, never thinking they are going to end up with a day of reckoning. The church of Laodicea, which is characteristic of the end time, the church of Laodicea, they describe themselves as being rich and wealthy and need of nothing. But from God's vantage point, they were poor and blind and naked. They were wretched. They were miserable. That was how God saw them, and yet they saw themselves the very opposite. You look at a line of animals at a slaughterhouse, and maybe you see a proud bull that's just waiting to be slaughtered. And you look at those animals, and you say, you know, those poor dumb animals, they have no idea, they have no clue what is awaiting them. And you know, they don't even have enough sense to realize what is going to happen to them in the moments ahead. But you look at mankind. And mankind is behaving the same way. I mean, you read the Bible and you look at the behaviors of our world today and the depravity as it, as it just explodes, you think they have no clue that they are going to be accountable before God someday for all of these excesses and all of these sins. They have no clue about allowing this depravity and what it's, what it's doing. The indictment. There's none righteous. No, not one. And then Paul has just given us all this evidence to show that we are depraved. I can't imagine anybody reading this and seeing God's vantage point of, of the human race and seeing that there is not enough evidence to convict on the indictment. And the judge of all gives the verdict. And starting in verse 19, you have this verdict. And you can divide it probably in three different ways. Three things that we should understand. It says, now that we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that, number one, every mouth should be closed. After hearing this argument, the response should be one of humility. It should close your mouth. You know somebody is close to being saved when they're no longer arguing with God. They're no longer giving all these excuses. When they're willing to throw themselves on the mercy of of God to throw themselves before the cross and say, I have no defense. I recognize the sin in my life. I'm not trying to excuse it. 
I'm not trying to blame it on somebody else. I recognize it's an issue in my heart that I have to get it right before God. I can't blame anybody else for it. When you look at the law, it should, number one, close every mouth. The second reason for the law is it makes everybody accountable to God. The whole world becomes accountable to God, whether you're Jew, whether you're Gentile. It puts everybody on the same ground. Nobody passes when you have the standard of the law. To try to take the law and to be saved is like trying to jump out of a plane and grab onto a sack of cement instead of a parachute. It just takes you down harder and harder. It makes you more and more responsible and accountable because it's more and more clear that we've sinned when we look at the law. And the Pharisees, they tried to take the law and tried to make themselves righteous before God. And the law was meant to show us that we don't have a righteousness, that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. So number one, it should stop our arguing and it should make us recognize that we are accountable to God no matter who we are. And the third statement that he gives is because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. By the works of the law, by church attendance, by, by doing things. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, by holding enough Bible studies. If you're a Mormon, by going to enough, to enough ten, temple rituals. None of that will save you. But the only hope that we have is God's provision through Jesus Christ. The law was meant to be a schoolmaster, Paul said, to lead us to Jesus Christ to show us that not a one of us measures up and that what God is looking for is for us to recognize that and to seek a Savior. And that Savior's name is Jesus Christ. Let me, uh, let me close by sharing with you a story I heard about a, a, a king who went on one of his slave ships. And as he was going on this slave ship, he walked to the galley, and the galley had these prisoners that were chained to the oars and had the drum and had the... Uh, all of them going in, in unison and the lash going from the, from the slave master who would walk the aisles. And as he would walk through the, uh, the lower deck of the ship where these men were rowing, he would talk to different ones and he would ask them, why are you here? And he got all different stories. One of them said that he was in a crowd when a crime happened and they just grabbed him and accused him of the crime. Another one said, well, my enemies accused me of something I didn't do. And false witnesses stood up, and uh, I, got, I got punished for it. And this is my punishment. And finally he got to one man, and this man surprised him by saying, I deserve to be here. He says, I am guilty, and I am receiving what I deserve. Well, this king was taken back by that. Then he turned to the man, he turned to the slave master, and he, then he directed his, his, uh, his uh, statement at the man. He said, you rascal, you scum. Why are you here among so many honest and innocent men? He spoke to the slave master, get him out of here. He should not be here with the rest of these, with these honest people. And they released him. And that's what God is looking for in our lives. For the excuses to stop, for the mouths to stop. For us to recognize that this is a description not of those who are in prison. This is a description of who we are as part of the human race. That these things are true about us but that God has sent his son to die for us, to pay the debt of this sin nature within us. And as that debt is paid, the Holy Spirit enters into our lives and we become brand new creatures. And that there is a new power through the Holy Spirit that can make us live a life that's consistent with who Jesus Christ is. But if we try to do it on our own, we're going to find these things will gravitate to the surface because they are in us to the core. And if we try to live by the flesh, we will begin to show the deeds of the flesh, as subtle as they are. But if we surrender and recognize this is true about us and seek the Spirit, the Spirit's power in our life, then the power of the Spirit will come through in our life as He begins, as we surrender to Him and He begins to live His life through us. What is God looking for? God is looking for, number one, that we recognize our depravity. He's looking, number two, that we realize the true purpose of the law, and that is to identify sin in us. And number three, that we rest in a Savior. And that Savior's name is Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you if you would bow your heads and close your eyes.
Father, we do thank you tonight. We thank you for the redemption that comes through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the only hope that we have, and yet it's the hope that you've provided. And Father, tonight as we study your word, and as Paul is making the argument for, for us to understand that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, he says some things that we don't really want to hear. He stated some things that are true about each one of us that we don't like to think about. But Father, he has done that in order for it to open eyes so that our hearts might open as well and we might receive Jesus Christ in our lives. And that you might redeem us and make us new creations that we might be able to walk in newness of life. We pray tonight during this invitation time that, that you would speak to us. Pray that we as a church would be sensitive to your spirit and as individuals.